Hello, everyone. Today is Thursday, March 9th, 2023. This is the week in charts. I'm sure I thank all you guys and girls for attending tonight. I appreciate you taking time out of your busy schedule to be here. So what are we talking about? Well, obviously, current market conditions. I have a lot to say about that. Your questions on trading and your favorite stock of crypto picks. If you don't mind, hold off on your stock of crypto picks until we get to the live charts. And that way I won't accidentally delete them. And also just ask about one question, at, uh, one uh, stock or one ticker at a time. All right, so we would focus on, uh, they had some last minute requests. Uh, I, I need to start putting out requests earlier in the week. And so if you're in a Facebook group, feel free to ask anything and I'll, and I'll try to remember to start a topic, maybe even as early as, as tomorrow. So we could, I can work on these things ahead of time because usually at the last minute I realize I haven't asked anything and then I, I scramble to get it all done. But anyway, one of the questions, pull back deep, deep enough, the psychology of the market and a few other questions. So we'll get to those in just one second. I'm going to do an intraday trading brief update. I was going to pass this week, but then I think it's important for me to keep up with this. And then through the process, me learning a lot and I want to turn around and teach you a lot. And then a lot of psychological issues that I've been dealing with there, and, and a lot of that will be fleshed out. Uh, the drawdown, that's from last week, so we talked about that already. But I'd be happy to uh, talk about that if you want to. And then uh, we're in a bit of a crypto bear market once again, so we'll I'll flesh that out when we get to it. This is the screen. As you know, you can lose money trading or as I'll sum it up. All predictions are about the future and a lot of stuff can happen between now and then. And that's my buddy Greg Moore said that. I want to do a, a brief update on a couple of positions, one good, one bad. The VTS, this is left over for my stock chart show, but that was the original parameters down there, 1815 with a stop at 1575, an IPT of 2055. So this is what it looks like on the chart. Now, I didn't get in on that opening gap reversal day, and sometimes that can go against you. The next day it could gap up and you could miss a setup, but I applied a little bit, excuse me, a little bit of discretion and I got in a few days later. Anyway, this is these were the original parameters, so I did hit that IPT, and this is uh, one of the few winners that we've had lately. Really had had a whole lot of winners lately, unfortunately, and that's been a real bummer. And you know, one thing I was saying about earlier, it's like I know when I was newer to trading, I just thought that man, these professionals, they must never stress out, and and how can they be so calm? And it's like, no, it, <laughs> I, you know, especially especially me because I am an emotional guy. Anyway, those are the parameters that I use. So, so the point I was trying to make there, let me just close the loop on that, is uh, feel it's okay to feel stressed out. It, it's very normal, and that's the thing about trading is like you feel like sometimes it's not normal and there's something wrong with you, and that's why I talked a lot about the knowledge gap and I've been working a lot about on that lately and on some writings that I'm doing. And it's taken me forever to flesh it out, but it's I think it's good stuff to say so myself. And the knowledge gap, if you watch the video on my website, is when after a trade, you think that if you knew more, you wouldn't have had the loss. And that's not always the case. Anyway, I'll flesh that out in more details later. Now, this was the hut. This one actually stopped out today. But you can see it triggered. And unfortunately, just continued to slide. And then I didn't have a chance to update the chart right before we went live, but it's actually traded down below 135. So that turned into a bit of a bummer. Now, HUT is Bitcoin mining related. And as I've been saying over and over lately, it's like Bitcoin and, and the other crypto has gone from 1999 to 2000 quite a few times. And right now, we're in a pretty bear, pretty serious bear market. And I was actually heavily short this morning and I went ahead and lifted them. I prefer not to be short because if these things go, they can go up 100% or more, but you have to play the hand that's dealt. And that's why I did short them. And I did put on a couple of shorts right before we went live or about an hour ago, I should say. But anyway, that one stopped out. So that's something a guru has never shown you, a losing trade. And believe me, we've had a few lately. Okay, let me jump into this intraday trend trading experiment. I've done a little intraday trading throughout my career. I believe that if you can possibly get in early and ride a an ETF or a stock such as patterns such as Russian doll or an ogre, 
or something like that. It, it, you can ride them all day and put in an IPT and put in a trailing stop and go about your life. That's the ultimate goal. It's not to stare at a screen all day long. And I've preached against day trading quite a bit. And some of you guys, uh, I have um, clients that tend to, they, they're with me for a while, then they go off and do other things, then they come back to me many years later. A few of you guys have come back and it's, and thank you. And you're like, wait a minute, Dave, are you day trading? And it's like, eh, <laughs> a little bit here and there. And I think, as I'm going to flesh out in just one second, if I could just wait for a route day, I think I would do okay. And that's the reason I'm showing you these charts. I'm showing you what the chart looks like. This is a 30 minute spy. And as I said, quite a bit, I've upped my charts to 30 minutes to avoid a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot of noise. And I'm not gonna bore you with those stories, but it happened by accident where I got to a 15 minute chart and then I took it one step further. But the reason I wanna show you the charts and what happened is so that you could see what happens on a good trending day. Now on that day there, I don't know what happened and I didn't have enough time to go in and look at it. And that's one reason why I'm gonna to continue to follow up with these, you know, check back often, but I'm gonna to continue to follow up with this presentation or this part of the presentation so I could figure out what's going wrong and why I didn't make money. But I should have made money on that particular day. Don't know why I didn't. Now here you have a nice persistent trend day. It did have a little fake out early in the morning and that would be a good day to be trading. And I did make a little bit of money on that day. Now it was Friday. Now I think I could have made more. I might've gotten faked out early on. And the other thing I remember doing on Friday was there was some out of the money options on some of this crypto stuff that just seemed too good to be true. And then I later found out, well, it was too good to be true because it, it expired by not, it expired out of the money. So I lost all the money on it, but it was very small money-wise position, but it was a substantial amount of options. And I felt like it's kind of a Niederhofer type of thing where a black swan type of thing where if, if the market would have really taken off, I know there's a lot of, you know, if, a lot of ifs in trading, right? but it really would have paid off. So I felt like it was worth the cost. I'm not too upset about that, although I really should have done a lot better than that on Friday. Now this does not look like a good day. It ran up a little bit and then it kind of drifted off and I got creamed on this day. So I'll have to go in and look, but if memory serves, I think I, I tried to play the upside and I tried to play the downside and I failed miserably on both. Now at first glimpse, this looks like a pretty good day. And then I realized that I lost money on it somehow. And then when I looked a little bit more carefully at the chart, noticed that it went down and went straight up and then it went up again, you know, after drifting lower and faking out quite a bit and then sold off. So I need to work harder, especially in this market to possibly widen my high lows out or pay attention to the high lows and make sure they're making highs and lows with vigor before getting too aggressive. Not every move is gonna turn into the mother of all trends. And that's one of the problems is seeing the forest for the trees when it comes to some of this stuff. And believe me, I'm working to become more and more hands off. Now you can see this day here, it sold off, it rallied, it sold off, and then it rallied again. Horrible day to try to catch an intraday trend. And you can see I did lose a little money. Now today we had the gap higher, and I did lose a little money on the long side, thinking it might have been a gap and go. And then when the market imploded, I did okay. As I've been saying quite a bit, I've got a trading buddy and uh, he hasn't been really active last uh, couple of weeks, but usually on a day like today, he'll call me up and say, you crushed it, didn't you? And I'm like, yeah, I did okay. And so 800 bucks on, on, on today's trades. Now, as I'm gonna get to in a minute, I'm kind of jumping ahead, the ultimate goal would be like on a day like today, I lost on a position trade. And I think I, my other position trades I had on, I have one trade that's on that's outside of the service and that's it. And that's ATAT. That was a, a IPO that I took that it was not mentioned in the service, but I have everything else that's in the service. And so that, the ATAT went down and then the, um, Something else went down today. Well, I'll, I'll, the stupid hut, right? And this is a this didn't make up for everything, but I was thinking right before we're live how great it would be if I was having a route day. Not that I want to hedge, okay? Hedging is a bad idea. It costs a lot of money. It wastes a lot of money. 
And if you do it properly, the money you make on the hedge, you're losing it elsewhere, so it all washes out. But rather than a hedge, take an outright position in the market if it's sliding like it is, or like it was today, and then you could make back some of that money that you've lost on your position trade. So that would be like my ultimate goal with this, is to figure out how to sit on my hands during an obviously choppy day like this. Now, you won't know till the end of the day if you had a trend day or not, but there are things you could do, like I've talked about before. If you look at the quick clips on my website, I just put a new one in there today, by the way. Uh, when I say website, I mean, I meant to say YouTube, and I'm at Dave Landry on YouTube. If you go look at the quick clips, I do have one or two in a series, maybe three, on Holy Grail Day hunting. And one thing that I recommend doing is make sure you only enter once you begin to see an expansion of range. So in other words, let's say if the S&P 500, I think I'm using a 10-day average true range, if the high minus low for, let's say, the spiders is only like 10 cents, or I'm sorry, 10% or something like that, then you know you just got a narrow range choppy day. So let that broaden out a little bit. And like an ETFs, make sure it's beginning to broaden out to like 40 or 50%, because if you're going to have 100% or more wide range bar, meaning today's bar is is 100% or more of the average, then it's going to first have to go to 50%. So this is a pretty sickly looking profit <laughs> thing. It was kind of funny. It's like this thing went kind of straight up for a while. And that's when you always need to think, okay, this... I'm hitting it just right. Uh, it's it's bound to um, to come unglued a little bit. And I did step on the gas a little bit, admittedly, and that was a mistake. And uh, I think I'm going to flush out a lot of mistakes through this process. And the, the psychological burden has been really, really tough. So I might need to back off on that. Like I've been saying, when you say yes to something, you're saying no to something else. And then the crypto has kept me pretty busy. So it's kind of like all these things are going on. Plus, I'm doing these presentations, obviously. But anyway, that's a pretty ugly drawdown. And those are just those those are just the actual profits. That's not the entire equity or whatever. So it's not it's not killing my equity that bad. It's not the end of the world, but it does begin to weigh on you a little bit. And it's amazing that even though the losses aren't phenomenal, I mean, I'm going to live the fight uh, another day, right? It does kind of weigh on you, especially when the position trading isn't going well. So it's kind of a double whammy. If the position trades are going well, and this is going well, then everything's great in the world. And if the position trades are going well, and crypto is going well, and this is going well, then it's like you feel like God. But that only lasts a short time, believe me. Anyway, ideally, again, it'd be kind of cool, like on the bad days, if the route days against me okay let's say i'm long stock and then the market uh sound like i'm from long island in the yeah uh, and the stock begin to sell off then maybe i could pick up a little money in intraday profits and smooth out my equity but there's a chance they add insult to injury so i realize i'm not selling you on it that much nor do i really want to especially after years of preaching against it one thing i would be careful about is is the um Heisenberg theory on quantum physics or whatever, as I've talked about before, when you go to look at a little particle, if you're not careful, if you breathe or something, and then you bump the particle around. So it's not really doing what you think it's doing. It's doing, it's being influenced by you. So it's like, I got to be careful that I'm not trying to influence y'all, or, or I'm sorry, I'm not trying to impress y'all with these traits. I need to be careful with that. And in that, along those lines, what I'm thinking is, there's probably some days where I shouldn't be making any trades. It's it's I don't want to say it's easy to make money, but it's not hard to make money when the market is doing the right thing by persisting and going in one direction. You get a route day like today. The hard part, as I'm, I'm kind of getting ahead of myself, but the hard part is when it's keeping the money in between. And that's kind of trading in general, too, by the way. And I know I've said this quite a bit lately, but like somebody said last year, I was too picky. And I took it as a compliment because we did a lot of sitting on our hands. And I'm very proud of that. Well, it took me a long time, 10 or 20 years, to learn how to sit on my hands that much. And I was thinking right before I went live with this intraday stuff, it's I haven't been doing it 20 or 30 years. So maybe there's a lot that I need to, uh, to learn there. Also, the market is not a, a money-making machine 
Livermore actually talked about that years ago. You can't really expect a paycheck out of it. And that's where I got to be careful to just not expect a paycheck every day and to just sit on my hands when, it, when it's just flat out not worth it. Uh, there's that route day again. I could print money on a route day, okay? It's the keeping it that's hard. And on a day like today, let's say that I've been trading well lately. Not that it should make that big of a difference, but I've kind of backed way off as I should. And I'm going to talk a little bit about that when it comes to the core methodology in just a few minutes based on one of your questions. But I have backed off quite a bit, and I'm a little less aggressive. Even on these route days, I've, I've backed off considerably. So maybe over time, I'll be able to sit on my hands and then step on the gas a little bit. There's a potential for tail, tail chasing. So today, I actually lost money on Sox L. And then I made it all back plus five times that amount or two times that amount at least on the other side. But there's been days where I lose money on both sides and it could be frustrating. Uh, the focus is really tough because I'm working on these presentations. I'm working on these projects. I'm 80,000 emails behind. Like I said last week, uh, somebody probably two weeks past now since somebody emailed me and I still haven't gotten back to them. I'm not being... Uh, a pain in the butt. <laughs> I've just got a lot going on. But the focus is tough. I lost money on some moves that I really should have caught. And psychologically, that's kind of tough. It's like, damn it, why did I miss that? So it's it's really putting putting me through a lot of iterations, a lot of cycles, which has a potential to have a negative effect on you, plus making all the decisions as I've talked about more and more. Now, what I need for that is more commitment devices. I need to set it a uh, uh, an alert in all these markets. Let's say I'm I'm not super interested in trading, but maybe set an alert that'll let me know when that market gets out of that 50% range, or maybe when it's at 40%, or maybe after it sells off hard, it comes back in and it's a mother of all re reversal. So I need to make sure I put those alerts in place. So I think more commitment devices are needed um, I haven't fully adjusted to volatility, and, and along those lines, I've been trading not to lose since I've been in a drawdown, which sometimes creates those losses. Oh, I'm going to go, I'm going to take a stab at this, risk just little amount, and before you know it, I've lost a lot more than I intended to risk, plus I get stopped out, and then, of course, the market turns, turns around and takes off without me. So what I'm trying to say is if I just let the market come to me, I could do this. <laughs> I'm not taking my hands more. I kind of feel like, like I said earlier, if I don't make any trades, then then I have nothing to show you. But that's probably a good thing, and that's probably a good lesson in and of itself. Uh, the question is, what about some form of Dave light on that hourly chart? Uh, yeah, the Landry light. That's a, that's a great idea. Um, I need to. That's one thing I was doing a while back. I had the 30 minute chart up of the spiders and I had the Landry light indicator plotted on it. And uh, that that seemed to help quite a bit. The only problem is gaps, gaps, gaps overnight kind of mucked that up a little bit. But yeah, you're definitely onto something there, John, for sure. And you know, maybe what you could do is, um, is, is, plot a lower time frame, lower than 30 minutes, just to see what's happening, and then jump back to that 30 minute uh, time frame. Uh, I'm not gonna go through all these because I've, I've went through them quite a bit and I've been talking about it for weeks, so. But just to kind of recap a couple things, I said I wouldn't do it, I do it anyway, right? I did step on the gas, like I said, when I was doing well, I thought I could just um, turn, you know, parlay a small account into a huge account really quick and be like, hey, look what I did. Uh, but, you know, the market will humble you, <laughs> believe me. Uh, and the bottom line is less would be would be more. And again, like I said earlier, insult to injury. The, the positive thing that's coming out of it, and you guys are seeing a little piece of that here and there, such as like the knowledge gap and things like that, is that it is it does force you to go through these longer term cycles especially from a psychological basis that might take six or eight months or even a year or so in trading the core methodology you have you know you, you catch a few big winners and then you catch a couple of losers and then you win lose win lose win lose well that might take 
six or eight months or a year longer, as I just said. And then you finally like, aha, I, I, now I understand this and all. And you go through those longer term psychological cycles. Well, you can go through those cycles in one day, <laughs> in one hour. So as I mentioned earlier, I did ask for questions and I got a few. Any questions or anything so far? Brian says, so very frustrating. Look at the markets. Most stocks off major lows, but nowhere near highs. First thrusts are out. Bow ties are out. Wait for new highs. Um, well, we should be able to find some bow ties and first thrusts and things like that eventually. But yeah, it's good that you're frustrated, okay? And that's one thing I was thinking about earlier. And there's different forms of frustration. Believe me, there's a frustration of getting stopped out. There's a frustration of possibly missing a move in something. And and it's it's a little philosophical, but if you're feeling frustrated from two different standpoints, one, it's good and from two different standpoints. One, it means the market is doing its job. If it was easy, everybody would be doing it. And that's what separates the men from the boys, so to speak, is when it does get a little aggravating and a little frustrating and you got to work a little harder and you end up working harder and harder and harder to do nothing. And God, that is a hard thing to do. And it doesn't bother me as much anymore. It's like I've learned to, this is another thing I was thinking about earlier too. It's like I've learned to accept and embrace all these nuances that I've learned over the last 30 years with the core methodology and I just accept it. Now, let me interview myself. Do I get upset still? Yes. And then I get especially upset. Like today when the HUD stopped out, I was a little down in the dumps because I'm thinking like, shit, I just lost money. And some of my clients lost money on that. Some, I say some because not everybody takes everything. So it's like, it's kind of a double whammy for me. Now on the plus side, when something works, it is kind of nice, of course, <laughs> when somebody says they can't make any money, I was like, well, did you catch that big winner? Like, no, I didn't take that, but I took those turds you recommended, those other turds. Anyway, so yeah, it's okay to be frustrated, Brian, and, and you know, just, just wait it out. And if you're frustrating, you know, again, that's the market doing its job. If it's easy, everybody's doing it, be doing it, but then let it come to you. And God, if I could figure out, especially like on the Zitra Day stuff, on, on, the, on the daily stuff, like I said, I figured out the nuances and I figured out that I, I could wait and wait and wait and wait and wait until I really like something and I'll do okay. And and like, again, like somebody said, I'm too selective, but again, I take that as a compliment, but it's with the, with the intraday stuff, it's really easy to get sucked in if you're not careful as opposed to waiting. And And it's kind of weird, the cycle I do go through with the intraday stuff, I've done a little bit more than I'm showing you here. But it's like I'll reach a point where I'm totally frustrated and I'll, I'm 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 gonna quit. That's it. I'll never do it again. And then the next day we get a route and I dog pile on and I make a lot of money. <laughs> you know, so it can be a little perverse. So this one I just saw right before I went live. I would like to know when gaps against the trend become a non-factor if they happened three to six months ago previously. Or are they still a factor of stock selection? Okay, it depends. I mean, obviously, if it's within the setup and it's against the setup, then you want to avoid that stock. So you got a stock pulling back and all of a sudden you've got a gap. Unless it's commodity related, you want to avoid that stock. If it's a small gap way back in time, don't worry about it. If it's a huge gap down, let's say, and the market's at low levels, remember that markets have really long memories. And if somebody held through that gap down, let's say the market was in a downtrend and you got a huge gap down, they're like, F it. I'm just going to hold this thing forever and look to get out at break even someday. So they're, they're pent up sellers waiting in the wings. OK, so I don't have a hard and fast answer for you, but it depends. OK, and if you find something that has a gap that you like, let's bring it up in Facebook. And I think that we just have to go through iterations of these things. And as one of my clients said, some of this stuff or a lot of this stuff is caught not taught i never fully understood that but i think if we're looking at examples then i could say nope i don't like that one because look at that big gap way back there even though it's way back in time you get a lot of people that are trapped on the wrong side of the market okay so hopefully i answered that enough but please bring up charts 
and I'll be happy to go through them. Okay, so the next thing I want to cover or talk about is how do you know when a pullback is deep enough, okay? Sometimes it appears when the pullback is too deep, it may go up and then start moving sideways. Well, there's nothing you can do about that happening because it happens, right? I'll just, well, I just already demonetized. Shit happens, right? <laughs> so let's go through a couple examples of that. And he also mentioned VZ. So a couple of thoughts. 99.9% .9 of the time, I just eyeball it, okay? And then you got to ask yourself, was the trend significant coming into the pullback, okay? And was there a sufficient enough players that were likely knocked out, okay? And possibly some shorts attracted. There's a lot of mumble jumbo when it comes to technical analysis out there. My technical analysis is two things, performance-based trading, okay? I want to be in strong markets. And if we're in a raging bull market like we were a few days ago in crypto, I want to be buying the strongest pairs. For the most part, I do play I play pullbacks, except in IPOs. I do some breakout stuff there. And if we get in a rip roaring bull market someday, I'll I'll probably do relative strength, which is performance-based technical analysis once again, just buying stuff that's moving in the new highs. A little bit more of a breakout characteristic there. But you want to make sure you got a really good trend, make sure the performance is there, and then you want to make sure enough players have been knocked out. So that's the psychological part of the technical analysis. That's the second part. You're reading the mind of the market, okay, reading the emotions of the market, and at the same time embracing your own, because as I preach, from a neurological standpoint, you cannot eliminate your emotions. I got into a heated debate with someone about that the other night, <laughs> a friend of mine's wife, and my wife and him, the husband, actually went off to the bar. They got sick of, sick of me arguing because I'm not, if I'm right and I know I'm right, then I'm not going to give up. And then I saw another meme that could be me too. It's like, if I realize I'm wrong, then I might go an extra 10 or 15 minutes just to aggravate you. I scored incredibly low in agreeableness, and which, which is a horrible trait to have if you're going to be a trader. The mental edge of trading is that, uh, oh, I always swear I'm going to remember his name. Larry, Larry Williamson wrote a book along with Larry Williams on, uh, on trading. Anyway, it's a good book. I'll I'll put the link up in post, and I have it on my uh, website under book three, and I'll put that link up too. Uh, you can quantify it. I, I'm not a huge fan of making things mechanical, although I do certain things every now and then. Uh, years ago, I did program literally thousands of trading systems, and that actually turned me into a, to a discretionary trader. But I did come up with a few things so I could show people something that's a little bit more mechanical so they can learn the the process. And if you're new to trading, maybe just trade these Landry Light pullbacks and nothing else. And I'd be willing to bet you'd have a hard time finding any in this particular market, any that are worthwhile at least, or any period. But you can quantify it. You could use Landry Light pullbacks to the 30 EMA. Now, be warned, I showed a couple of crypto pairs, I think it was like a couple of weeks ago, where I showed the Landry Light, but it didn't quite get down to the 30, but it, it had gone so far up, it was such a deep retracement that it was plenty deep enough. And we'll look at plenty deep enough here in one second. But the 30 might be too far away if you're waiting for it to pull all the way back to the 30 on something that's in a rip-roaring trend. And of course, make sure it's a good setup to begin with. I'm going to pick on um, somebody who showed me Verizon or whatever, forget who showed me, I'm gonna pick on them a little bit. And and that's part of the better ingredients, better pizza, Papa John approach to trading is you might be concerned about the pullback being deep enough, but also work on your stock selection to make sure that you're picking the best stocks to begin with. By the way, I think, I'm pretty sure the stock selection course becomes free after you stay a member, a gold member for so long, or a service member because you get the gold free. Just an FYI on that. Not a shameless plug, just to let you know, just if you're serious about sticking with it, then all the courses eventually become free because if you're serious, I'm going to give you the courses too. So again, make sure it's a good setup. You want to have decent HV, and I'm going to walk you through one of these. Strong trend, nowhere, nowhere head supply. And ideally, a persisting trend, accelerating trend, and all the other qualifiers 
that I talk about for the trend, such as a gap in the direction of the trend, small gap, not something crazy, and not a whole lot of trend qualifiers against. Okay, so once you have identified a solid trend, make sure that the knockout move is meaningful. By that, I'm talking about the TKO. And I wanted to show you, I just pulled this old slide from Trading Full Circle. I pulled a lot of my slides from that. So this is a nice persistent stock. And it technically, it's a TKO because it's a two bar low. I think that, that was original rules. But you want it to be on a pretty wide range bar. So you want it to look something like that. So this is kind of an easy way to kind of show you is a pullback deep enough. Now we'll go through a few more examples here, but the litmus test would be, was it big enough to attract some shorts? Remember with the TKO pattern, like all my stuff, it has a psychological backing. The psychological backing is number one, some shorts have been attracted. Number two, or actually should be first and foremost. So let's make that number one. Number one, some longs have gotten knocked out and they might want to get back in. Number two, some shorts have likely been attracted to the market. And basically, we're looking to take advantage of the predicament of these traders. The longs get back in and the shorts get forced out. Now, the good thing is shorts are pretty damn obstinate, okay? And they don't believe that a market deserves its valuation. So what they'll do is they'll, because they're egotistical, as a general statement, they're going to hang on to that stock and it goes straight back up. And they can't believe it deserves that valuation or whatever. They might even short more. And that's kind of like along the lines of something I never could understand is trends existed as long as people fight them. Well, that makes sense. As long as shorts are trying to fight a trend, they're being forced to cover at much higher levels. And that's how sometimes these things go parabolic, which ironically, I learned a few years later that after publishing this pattern, that there, there, there's actually a shorting the parabolic strategy, which I think is a bad idea, but that's a story for another day. So where recent longs stopped out, and if you were a longer term holder of this, let's say you got into a swing trade and then it turned into a longer term position, would you likely have been knocked out of the position? Or even if you were swing trading it, would you likely have gotten knocked out? It doesn't happen often, but there's been a few times where I've recommended a stock, we've taken the initial profit target out, we've gone into trend following mode, it's knocked us out, okay? It knocks us out on a Wednesday, and then on a Wednesday night, I show the same exact setup again. Not often, there's only a few times that I can remember this happening, but sometimes it's like, nice little uptrend, bam, knockout move, we get in, nice little uptrend, bam, knockout move, we get knocked out. So long if things for all the fish, better than the poking the eye type of trade, and then we get right back in the next day. Now, again, this is where I was getting, if you were long, would you have been stopped out? That's just one thing to ask yourself. Okay, so here's a recent setup. This is the one I showed earlier that, that did hit the initial profit target. It was an IPO, and it wasn't a huge, huge move, but it was a substantial move higher. It's about 38%, and I'm eyeballing, it looks more like 50%, but I, I, for some reason, I got 38%. That's probably about right. And then you can see it pull back fairly deeply, 2.6 points about a 13.5% retracement. Now, I'm not I'm not a big fan of, in fact, I don't even use, I don't use Fibonacci, but sometimes if you get a pure retracement like this, because you, you got an established low and established high, then yeah, some of those deep pullbacks might probably be a 3.86 or something like that. I, I, even, I hate to say that. I don't think there's anything magical about Fibonacci. And my biggest beef is a lot of people who, who use it will put a thousand lines on a chart and then eventually it'll hit one of the lines and hit another one of the lines and they're like, you see, it all came true. It's like, well, what about the other thousand lines in the chart? But I digress. I don't want to get in trouble either. <laughs> but as you can see, fairly deep pullback based on the magnitude of the trend. So MBLY was another one of these setups. And uh, just full disclosure, I did not take this one. It, it had a gap and a fast move on the open. It came back in. But I am looking to get long somewhere around this high, maybe right below the high, should it uh, should it trigger again. But you can see in this case, it was an IPO, and it had a pretty good run. That other stock, by the way, was an energy stock. So a little bit more lenient as far as wanting a serious trend or a really, really, really serious trend or something like that. But it was still a decent trend nonetheless. 
Here you have 23 points and change, or 93% move. So that's pretty substantial. And you can see that the more recent move was 19 points or 67%. So if you look at that, the bigger picture trend, it's like 100% almost. And if you look at it, the shorter trend here, it's about 70% round number. So those are two substantials, substantial trends, depending on how you look at it. John says, I did not take MBLY, but we'll take a second entry. Well, good, good. You know, and I don't want... I don't want anyone who took the trade mechanically. I don't want to rub salt in anyone's wounds. But sometimes a little discretion can can help. Now, the downside is, let's say tomorrow this thing gaps open 10 points. I mean, it could happen, right? Then I'm not in and John's not in and whoever else uses discretion is not in. And and you just have to you have to make decisions and live with them and 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 that's something that I actually wrote about earlier today. And you guys are going to see all this stuff eventually. But it's like, if you're not happy with the way your decisions are turning out, then make better decisions, okay? Become a better stock picker, which takes a little time, but it, it can be done. It can be taught and it can be caught. So bring up the charts on Facebook. Let me noodle with them. Give me permission to give you some tough love. And I'm not the grand poobah. And a lot of other people will chime in who've been doing it just as long as I have, in some cases longer, and are familiar with my methodology of trend following, let them chime in too. And just, you know, it's like little by little, it's like piece by piece. It's like somebody showed a chart that had a, a shit ton of overhead supply. So I drew a big flat, fat triangle and highlighted the overhead supply. And he's like, oh yeah, yeah, wow, okay. And I could tell it. He was thinking like, oh, I shouldn't have showed that. But it's like, you know what? Next time, I bet he's going to look for overhead supply, okay? And then next time, I'm going to show him there's a big fat gap way back there. He's like, okay, no overhead supply, no big fat gaps. Got it. Then he'll show me the next one. It's not persisting. It's chopping around. The net net price move is not there and so on and so forth. He's going to say, okay, now I think I have it. It's persisting. It's accelerating. It trades cleanly. No overhead supply, no gaps. So you can see piece by piece, you begin to kind of catch it, I guess, as, so to speak, as my client says, as opposed to, it was a caught, not taught. Anyway, so let's take a look at this. So you can see pretty deep pullback there. 10.83 points, 22.5%. So that's a pretty, pretty serious pullback. The chances are pretty good that some, somebody got knocked out of this stock. Now, again, like I said, sometimes you could quantify things, especially, especially if you're new earth to trading, by all means. And you can see here, if you look at the 30-day EMA and look at the Landry light, you can see it got out to about 20 and then it imploded because why? Because it came down here and touched the moving average, okay? So if you're new earth to trading, you could probably scan for these. I would re I'd still recommend you look at a, 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 boat a boatload of stocks every day, but you could scan for these just in case you miss something. I'd rather use a scan as a backstop as opposed to my analysis in and of itself. I look at, like I said, a couple thousand stocks every night, and that gives me a good feel for what's going on in the market. That's going to kind of answer one of the questions in a few minutes. But I'd recommend you look at a lot, but by all means, you could do some scans with this. And like I showed in the Facebook group today, they just added all my scans to the plugin. So if you want to scan for proper order or Landry light or something like that, you could certainly do it with the, the scanner on stock charts. And if you watch the last Trading Simplified show on my website, you'll see that. So here's a Landry light pullback. You see nice Landry light, about 20 bars or so pulls back to the EMA. So that's another way to determine if they're deep enough. Now, by the way, if you are trading Landry Light pullbacks, always look at the net-net price change because sometimes, and this isn't a perfect example, but you can see right here, this stock traded sideways for quite a while and you've got quite a bit of Landry Light when that happens. So make sure you look at the net-net price change and make sure your trend coming into the, to the setup is, is really good too. Here's the, the HUD example, and, and this one failed miserably, unfortunately. 
but you can see it was a Landry light pullback. So it pulled deep enough, pulled back deep enough. You see, you had this tremendous run in here, 100%, 150% or whatever. And then you had a fairly deep pullback. In this case, all the way to the 30 EMA. So in this case, that was deep enough. Now, Brian kind of insinuated like, well, sometimes they pull back deeply and they just don't work. Yeah, I know. Shit happens. <laughs> no shit, right? Part of that is a function of the shitty market that we're in right now. Pardon my French. My little French friend, you should say, but well, Dave, that's not French. That sounds like English to me. Part of it is in the mar the conditions that we're in. The conditions just are not really conducive to trading, and that's why I've been guilty of not doing a lot with the position trades. We we had a few lately. We got one. I think we got uh, one out of three or something like that. One turn in the winter, and we had a couple of losers. You know, so it's like it sucks. But that's what it is. You got to chip away at it, chip away at it, and maybe, just maybe, that one big winner is going to take care of those losers. We'll see. Now he was asking about Verizon as a deep pullback. Well, the first thing I know, and this is getting back to this kind of got me thinking about the stock selection. Like I said earlier, so before you you're looking at is the pullback deep enough? Is the stock worth trading to begin with? Okay, so kind of back it up a little bit before you kind of get to the nitty gritty. In this case, the HV was 20, and that's even after all these gyrations in here. So I'd be willing to bet if I rewound it back to this day here, it probably was much, 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 much lower. Also, a huge, thick company. A, a company like this would be good for opening gap reversals and uptrends or even downtrends. But I would not rush out and, and and position trade this on the long side so much and sometimes by the way sometimes and i'm just kind of looking at it sometimes you could you could and i don't know what the rest of the chart looks like but let's say that you were trying to short it i would prefer shorting a big thick stock like this because you've got institutional support and it gets dumped over time and sometimes you can get some really nice downtrends that come out of these things especially in a popular stock Anyway, notice that the pullback, yeah, it was deep enough, but it pulled back all the way to where it broke out from, okay? So that's that's of concern. So the pullback is into the prior breakout level, so that's too, that's too deep to go after. Plus, the HV is really, really low on that one, so. Okay, maybe something on the psychology of markets in general. And he says, sometimes you say stuff like conceptually sound, for instance, Conceptually correct, and, I, and, I've, and I've got that from Larry Connors. It's like one time I think I made a mistake or something in a trading system, and I did something that really didn't make a whole lot of sense, but it worked, you know? And uh, Larry said, well, it's not conceptually correct, so let's just let's toss it out. And I don't think it would have kept on working you know, either. It, conceptually correct means that like a TKO, okay? You're trading with the trend. And I remember when I showed him like a double top knockout and uh, he said, I've seen that pattern. I was bummed out thinking like somebody else had already published it or whatever. He goes, no, 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 I, I've seen that in the markets. And 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 he was kind of digging it and like, that makes sense. I was showing him my, um, the draft that I was working on for my first book, I think. Anyway, he he introduced me to the term conceptually correct. So you can't, there was there were some commodity traders once that noticed that when their cows were on one side of the field, soybeans went up. When the cows were on the other side of the field, soybeans went down. And there's no conceptually correct way to kind of tie that together. It was a completely random event, which seemed to coincide with the prices of soybeans. So that's not conceptually correct, okay? But if you're trading soybeans and they're in a strong uptrend and all of a sudden you're gonna knockout move, that's conceptually correct. So hopefully that answers that question. How to spot the market signs and psych uh, psychologic traits? When to be aggressive in a good market? Do you go by some indicators of size of land your list, your trading results, the indices, and could you use dynamic position sizes when the trend is not your friend? Uh, you've answered a lot of your own questions there, Laurent. Uh, so, one of the psychotic traits, I don't think that's what you were saying, but one of the psychotic trades I've seen, traits I've seen lately is the market doesn't know where it's headed. So it's like some people are buying and some people selling. It's a Jackie Mason market. And then those two people are flipping back and forth. 
So you got to ask yourself, is the market in a good mood, a bad mood, or just can't figure out what it wants to do? Right now, just can't figure out what it wants to do. You're trading traders, not markets. Now, with the core methodology, I do not change position size. And the reason being is maybe just maybe that VTS is going to take off, okay? Well, trading hadn't been great lately for the core methodology. And let's say we took a tiny position size there. Years ago, I, I tried that. It just doesn't work, okay? So you got to keep that position size constant. The way you back off on that or the way you compensate is you take fewer and fewer and fewer trades. And yes, your own equity curve is going to be one of your biggest clues there. The landry list, was it was it three or four stocks on there tonight? None of which I could give a flip about or want to trade at all. That is a good indication. When when I have to spend an extra half an hour or 15 or 20 minutes at least going through 50 stocks, okay? It's like it takes me forever to get to 50. Then I got to take those 50 and bring it down to something manageable like 10 or 12 or 20 or whatever. When I'm spending, like I said, an extra 15 minutes, maybe even half an hour, whittling those down, that's a good market, okay? When I'm going through my scans and five minutes into my scans, when I say scans, I, I run some very rudimentary scans and I'm looking at, like I said, a couple thousand charts. But five minutes in, if I'm two or 300 charts down where the HV is not completely crazy, and I'm like, oh yeah, I like that. Oh, I like that. It's like, I, I'll find my setups on a good day within five minutes or maybe even 10 minutes. But but usually usually I could find a setup if it's a good day in five minutes. I'd be willing to bet if you looked at, and that's something I should probably track. I'd be willing to bet if you look at all the huge winners that we've had over the years, most of those were found within the first few minutes of my analysis certainly within the last within within i'd say 10 minutes okay uh i used to have a goal to have all my uh charting done by about 3 30 and there's so much stuff that i do now there's no way i could do that mark closes at three central and i'm on central time but usually back in the day when i didn't have quite as much going on usually by 3 30 i had i had my setups for the next day when the markets are crappy like they are now, it just takes longer and longer to go through everything. And you check it, you double check it, and you look at your momentum list and all, and you're like, it's just not there. You exhaust all possibil all possibilities because you're so worried that that one's going to slip through the crack. That's going to be your all-time winner, right? But it's probably not going to happen. But you have to do your work anyway, okay? So yes to kind of all these things. Now, in the, in the intraday trading, I've backed off quite a bit. One, I don't have the incredible amount of experience, not that not that I'm the grand poobah or anything, but I don't have the time put in like I have with this other stuff. And, and like I said, I've done stuff throughout the years, like open gap reversals and things like that, and occasionally Russian dolls and all. But as far as like trading ETFs intraday and E-minis and all that, I don't have that type of experience that I have with the position trading. So. With the position trading, no, keep your position size the same because that really depends on the outlier. Now, with the day trading stuff, like I said, I back way down, back way off position size. Like a day like today, that should have been two or three K, uh, believe it or not. I know that sounds crazy. And that's on a fairly small account. Don't get me wrong, you know, it, it could be it could be even bigger. But I back off on those position sizes because the market just has been really, really crappy. So it's two different type of trading, wear two different type of hats. Core methodology, always keep a fixed position size. Don't back off. As soon as you back off, and believe me, it failed miserably years ago when I tried this. As soon as you back off, you're gonna knock it out of the park on one, and you're gonna regret it, okay? You're only risking 2%. 2% is plenty, believe me. It's like we just had a, a $2,000 hit today, and I feel your pain. And I did it across multiple accounts, so I feel multiple pain on that. Some bigger, some smaller. So it sucks. But at that size, it's just big enough to where if something really takes off and you do get that three and four and 500 and occasionally, not that often, but you get that 600% gain or more, it makes it all worthwhile. So yeah, all of the above, not so much indicators. Um, I would caution you to go down, to, caution you not to go down the indicator rabbit hole, but years ago, somebody pointed out that the ADX was really low in the S&P 500, and I was trading S&P futures back when it was a big contract and back when I didn't have a whole lot of money to trade them. 
and uh, it was tough. And I couldn't figure out why I was losing money. And he's like, you idiot. Mark's going straight sideways. He said, plot the ADX and draw your lines or whatever. And he was right. He was also kind of a bit of a jerk, but I needed that at the time. Maybe God sent it to him. <laughs> so, you, you know, you ask yourself, when it comes to the markets, getting back to the psychology of the market, is the market in a good mood, market in a bad mood, or is it psychotic, okay? Everybody had to throw the baby out with the bathwater today, right? We had a nice route lower. All right, okay, a trained monkey could trade this market today on the short side. Just start shorting and shorting and shorting and shorting. As long as it works, just keep shorting, right? Now, some of those other days I just showed you, it goes up, it goes down, it goes up, it goes down. You got the Jackie Mason market. It begins to implode. It implodes. It goes straight back up. And that's another advantage, like I said, uh, or been talking about lately, is like the tape reading. My tape reading has gotten a lot better. And, and it also helps me recognize what's happening longer term. By looking at those 30-minute charts all day long, I'm seeing, okay, this market is acting psychotic on a 30-minute basis. Let me look at the daily chart. Yeah, we were going up a couple days ago. Now we're going down. You know, what will tomorrow bring? There's no trend, right? It's just all over the place. So good mood means good mood means there's demand, okay? Bad mood means there's supply. And sideways or psychotic means that supply is meeting demand. And the person with the supplies become the person with demand. That's flipping back and forth like a uh, psychotic Bronco running towards a burning barn. Have Marcy's a guest one day. <laughs> I only had her on, uh, I had her once, I did a little um, thing for stock charts and uh, I had her on to say Merry Christmas or Happy Holidays or whatever is politically correct these days. All right, let's uh, shift to crypto real quick and then we'll pop out the stocks. The, the crypto now, like I've been saying, it, we're back to the bear market again, which is a bummer, you know, because not that long ago, like a week ago, I was doing incredibly well with crypto. So if we take a look at, let me just see what's happening over here. Yeah, I'm making a little bit. So if we take a look, I'm short a couple of these. I'm short E and J. Let me show you a couple of them short. Uh, oh crap, I'm no longer short that one. Watch, let's see if I'm Grimace. Let's see, I'm short. Yeah, see I was short this but I got knocked out. So I'm short that one and I'm short that one right now. And there's a whole lot more I could be short, but right now crypto is just not looking so hot. And if let's take a look at the, the overall shiz coins. I don't know if that's less vulgar to call them shiz coins. <laughs> Anyone from England in here where the word shiz is used? But not that long ago, you could sort these by the strongest and just by the strongest like this. But right now they're not doing so hot. And like I was saying earlier in Facebook, I did some scans to show me how many were below the 30 EMA and most of them were. Now, some of these are getting a little bit of a pop. Let's just take a look at like the major ones real quick. And then if you guys wanna look at any pairs, I'll be happy to do it. But that's the thing, people, I talk about Bitcoin, people poo-poo Bitcoin and crypto. And I'm like, well, just short them. I, I'm not afraid to short them. So you take a look at Bitcoin. Bitcoin's beginning to implode again. That's really a bummer, okay? Because we had nice land here. It's it's a little kind of crazy, but it did pull back to the EMA. And look what happened. Bam, it just come flying out of that. And it really looked like it was going to be off to the races, right? And now we have Landry Light to the downside. So that's... Right when it started improving, it turns right back down. So that's certainly a bit of a bummer. But if you sort this, if you look at some of the, if you look at it the other way, look at the, uh, look at the, how many of these things have absolutely imploded. So there's really nothing to do unless you're going to short some of these guys. And it might be shorting more pullbacks. Some of those ones I shorted, I was kind of doing the same thing that I do on the long side, just buy the ones that are going, uh, short the ones that are going down. All right, let's, uh, no questions on crypto quite a bunch today, no problem. If there's any, if you want to ask about a pair or something, and um, if you're not in Facebook and you want to ask about a pair, 
then all you need to do is just uh, leave a comment below if you're watching this on YouTube. Oh, by the way, um, if you want to attend these shows live, we'd love to have you. Usually, we have most of the people from Facebook here because I remind you guys before the show starts. But I would love to have anybody else that wants to uh, join in. Go to DaveLearner.com slash webinar. I actually took the date out of that because that's confusing everybody. The webinar is three months old or whatever. So now if you go to DaveLearner.com slash webinar because the data took, I took the date out and the way it's set up, register for one show and you're registered for all. Okay, let's take a look at the S&P 500. And you know, I could sum it up in uh, three words, choppy, choppy, choppy. If I could find it, where'd it go? Oh, there it is. Why is it in the wrong order? Okay, let's put a 200 and a 50-day moving average in here. The green line's a two. The green line's a 200, and the red line is the 50. So, like I said earlier, with any trend indicator, bad things happen below the 200, which is Mr. Uh, Guide and Baleo said that. I never did find nor read their article, but I know that's in that article. <laughs> they won some kind of award for it. But you can look at Landry Light or any indicator you want, any trend indicator you want, even something like the death cross, okay? I wouldn't take these death cross signals in and of themselves, but if you get a death cross, hey, you know, something bad could happen, and bad things tend to happen, right? And it's the magnitude, as I preach, and I've done presentations just on this in and of itself, of what happens. We look at this drop, let's say the death cross was like right here. It did rally a little bit, but then it dropped, what, uh, 20%? That's a pretty big move for market. Anyway, you can see the P's down below the 208 moving average. Draw your sideways line. Hey, go all the way back to win. You can go back a long, long, long ways, okay? So this is what I call a Rip Van Winkle sleep test. So you look at the market. Let's say you look at the market back here, okay? Where's the P's? P's are at 3,900, round numbers, okay? You go to sleep, you go to vacation, you go someplace, wherever you go. You open up a newspaper tomorrow, and it's like, okay, where are the S&P's? 3,900. Wow, nothing happened. <laughs> so you can see we're kind of wide and loose and all over the place. I think we are bottoming, but that bottom has been a process and I'm not going to call a bottom I just think that eventually all this wide and loose trading is going to resolve itself and it looked pretty good a couple of weeks ago but check back off to notice that again we're back below the 200 and the 50 day moving average 250 day yeah we're below both now so that's certainly not a good thing if you take a look at the dollar, the dollar's had a pretty good retrace in it, and it seems like the stronger dollar is bad for stocks. With commodities, a stronger dollar means you can buy more commodities, so the commodities tend to go down in price. But it seems like now, at least now, not all the time, I've shown presentations and charts where they do diverge or have negative correlations at time, or positive correlations, whatever the case may be. But right now, they seem to be negative correlated. As the dollar goes up, it seems to be pushing stocks down, maybe because it takes more dollars to buy stocks. I don't want to think too much. I don't want to hurt my brain. Okay, now is that composite, a little bit of a sell-off today, down 2% and change, all the way down to the 50. It has not made that golden cross back up. I think the P's have. Let me just double check that. Yeah, but I wouldn't take this signal in and of itself. A lot of lag and something like that, but it is something worth paying attention to. But it's interesting that the NASDAQ never did quite get there, and if we keep dropping, then it never will. But bigger picture-wise, looks like a bottoming process, okay? But that doesn't mean we can't come down and test the old lows once or twice. I mean, if you ask, you know, I, put a gun to my head, we're still in the bear market, right? Until we Until we get a at least a TFM 10% buy signal, which we almost had a couple of weeks ago, I'm going to say we're still in a bear market for now. But I don't want to label things because if it starts going up, it starts going up. And if I'm dug in being a bear, then I'm going to be trying to justify why the market should not be going up. 
The Rusty got whacked today. This is a bit of a bummer because this sort of looks more like a bottom than the other indices, but not with today's action. All the way down and below the 200-day moving average. So that's looking pretty ugly. Their energies, with the dollar being relatively strong as of late, have been, been a little bit weak in here. It looks like they want to come down to the bottom of their range. Sideways at best, there's nothing to do with the energies. Yes, they were, were in a longer-term uptrend, but they lost steam. But Dave, you want that VTS? Well, it's an IPO, and sometimes IPOs could trade in spite uh, or could trade contra to the overall market, that not, not necessarily always in tandem. But you could see energy sideways at best. But longer term, yeah, they're still kind of in an uptrend here. Positive slope in the 200-day and even the 50-day moving averages. But I wouldn't rush out and buy them at this juncture. Metals and mining have been getting whacked a little bit in here. That makes sense because the dollar has been kind of strong. Let's take a look at, oh, the banks. Yeah, one of you guys mentioned the banks earlier. I was looking at that. Look at the banks. Absolutely creamed today down four and almost a half percent. And that's a huge move for the banks. This sector has an HV of what, 19? So that's pretty low. What's the spiders just for s g 17. Okay, so pretty much in line with the market. So four and a half percent drop, apples to apples almost, in the market would be pretty significant. So that's a pretty big drop in the banks. Financials have got whacked pretty hard, gotten whacked pretty hard today, as you can see, well below the, 50 simple moving average. So you could argue coming into this week that, hey, we came down, we kissed the 50, we just gonna kiss it goodbye, gonna have a nice little rally up. But nope, came right back in. Drugs have been abysmal as of late. As you can see, they've rolled over in here. You know, another thing you might wanna do in some of these uh, areas is go through and look at bow tie proper order. Is a 10 less than 20? Is a 20 less than 30? 10 is simple, 20 and 30 are exponential. So you don't have to be a rocket surgeon to see that a lot of these areas aren't doing so well. Software looked okay up until today. You can see it got whacked pretty hard in here. It still looks somewhat okay longer term, kind of like the dog with least fleas, okay? And the semiconductors is still one of my favorite areas. And this is the one little glimmer of hope that I'm kind of hanging on to is that the semiconductors still look pretty good, although they stalled out a little bit in here today. But for the most part, they've been hanging in there. I like to see the semiconductors going higher to help confirm when the market is going higher. Of course, the market's not going higher now, but I would like to see these semis continue higher in here. So this is one positive. I really believe in watching what happens in the semiconductors quite a bit. Not that you time off of that in and of itself, it's just one little piece of the puzzle. All right. Individual stocks, you guys want to take a look at something. I know we talk about them all day in Facebook, but if there's something you want me to talk about or anybody new here tonight, feel free to bring something up. We'll take a look at it. The other thing, too, is there's not a whole lot of stocks out there right now. And I know some of you guys are thinking, like, man, you never like anything I pick. Well, there's just nothing out there. I don't like anything I pick lately, you know. All right, going once. No setups tonight, huh? Quiet bunch. Going twice. Well, as usual, I want to thank all you guys and girls for attending. I appreciate you taking time out of your busy schedule. Anything unanswered, if you're in Facebook, bring it up there so we can all participate. And if you're not in the Facebook group, why not? Just become a member of daylander.com, and then you can join, and I'll approve you. But for everybody else, just shoot me the email, daylander.com slash contact. And everybody have a great weekend. I'll see you guys and girls tomorrow on Facebook. Everybody else, have a great weekend. And may the trend be with you. Thank you so much. You are welcome, John.